How does the Holy Spirit empower our lives to deal with things outside our comfort zone? How does the Holy Spirit empower our lives to deal with perhaps difficult things, hard things that just may be outside of our comfort zone? Welcome to Columbia Life Church. I'm Pastor Val yeah, Yancey Valdez. And again, this is Columbia Life Church. It is, each week we gather together to create a sacred, sacred place where people can come and let God breathe new life and bring renewal into people's lives through faith, hope, and love in Jesus Christ. And you know what? We, we truly believe, I believe everybody, Everybody needs a chance. Everybody needs an opportunity to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here today. And we could not create this space without you guys, without our family, without our friends, without our partnership. So together we do this. It's not just me bringing a message. You guys also help create the atmosphere. You create the means through your prayers, through your finances, through your, through your help. We could not do this if we didn't do this together. And so, but we believe this. It, it comes from the firm belief that every human being needs an opportunity, get, needs a chance to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ. And so what we're doing here is important work. It's a high calling. And so thank you for being on this journey with us. We are so glad you're here. And if you're new with us visiting, we especially want to welcome you and say thank you for being here. In fact, we'd love for you just to go to columbialifechurch.org. Click on the link at the top that says, I'm new. Let us know you stopped. I would love to connect with you and have an opportunity to, uh, to meet you. In fact, when you do that, we, we, we celebrate by giving a, pledging a $5 donation to a charity of your choice. We would send out an email to you to let you know which, which charities we want. I would love, love to donate on your behalf. So go to that link, columbialifechurch.org. Click on the link that says, I'm new. And if you're a regular, click on the link that says, just to let us know, say hello. We'd love to know how we could best be praying for you and for love to be able to connect with you as well. So how does the Holy Spirit empower our lives to deal with things outside our comfort zone? You ever, you ever, you ever try to go outside your comfort zone? It's, it's a place of discomfort. I mean, obviously, it's, it, it's hard to go beyond where we feel comfortable. We have our space. We have our personal space. We also have a comfort zone. And a step out of that requires a little faith. And the farther you go out from that comfort zone requires a little bit more faith and maybe even God's grace and maybe God's power to go from where we're at to where God may be calling us to be. You know, in Acts um, chapter 1, verse 8, this is the, the, the verse we started with, oh, about eight weeks ago when we first started this series. Um, but we were, we were, we were faced with, a, with a, an undeniable and uncomfortable truth when Jesus spoke to his disciples in that moment it was before he was going to be ascended up into heaven, before he was going to go and enter into his glory. And he tells his disciples, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. And now just watch my hands. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Each one of those things, it's, it's an undeniable, it's an inconvenient truth, but, but it is also, an, it is also uh, an uncomfortable truth that we have to hold up, that when God calls us, he's usually calling us to greater places that are outside of our comfort zone. This is the spiritual journey. It is, the, it is the, literally the, the joyous invitation of God the Father that says, listen, I want, I want you to go on a journey with me because I want to demonstrate my majestic sovereignty over all things in heaven and on earth, and I want you to be with me on that journey. I want to show you, as you follow me, how through the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to go out and proclaim the kingdom of God, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. I mean, that's the power of God. But I know to do that, that's not going to come from my own power. That's going to come from God. God better be calling me. Because it's not going to happen in my own strength, wisdom, or power. It has to be from God. And so it's, it's an undeniable, inconvenient, uncomfortable truth. When you think that we have come from a long line of people that have said yes to God, we, we, I mean, we've literally been looking at, at, at their lives, the people who answered the call of God in their lives to go beyond the world that they knew. To go beyond the world that they knew. But understand this, that what I want to highlight in this part nine of our series this, is today is to highlight this fact is, or, or this truth or this thought that in order to go beyond the world that they knew, they had to leave their comfort zone. They had to leave. In order to go, they had to leave. In order to go, they had to leave. I'm going to say it again. In order to go, they had to leave. They had to leave. And that's not always easy. It's not easy to leave. 
And sometimes a powerful vision of the future is not enough. Not only is it just God calling us to go someplace and, and, and to go after this glorious vision, we also have to recognize that God is calling us out of a place as well. Right. Calling us out as well. It part, the, the call to go is also the call to leave, to leave that comfort zone. That, that's part of this. It's one of the most uncomfortable, I mean, when you think about, about how the Holy Spirit empowers, to, empowers us to deal with things outside our comfort zone, I mean, it's probably, when you, we think about this, you're, you're going into places where perhaps conversations are going to be a little bit more difficult. Actions are going to be a little bit more difficult. Finding my comfort food is going to be a little bit more difficult. <laughs> um, the things that, that I have my, my life so organized in my comfort zone, when God calls me to go, I'm going to have to figure out my life again in this new, in this new place. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. New relationships, new new cultures, uh, inter, inter, interacting with some new tribes, some new things. It's just different. Yeah. And we need God. We need God as part of this. And so um, one of the most uncomfortable conversations or issues one would ever have to deal with or work through when we're answering the call of God is one that the Lord brought to the attention of the church in Thyatira. This is a great case study. When you think of God speaking to a church and saying, you're going to need to deal with this, and it's not going to be comfortable but you need to deal with it. And so we turn to Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 to 29. Again, Jesus is speaking to his family. He's speaking to his church. He's speaking to, to people he loves. And, 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 he's, and, he, and he's speaking to this church in Thyatira. Uh, let's turn to uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 to 29. I'm going to actually read the passage, and I'm going to go back and highlight some things. But let me read the whole passage through so you can get a context of, of where we're at here. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 says this. This is, again, this is the Lord... Speaking, the way this letter comes to the church, it's the Lord speaking through, through John, the apostle who's in exile on the island of Patmos. And so John is, is, is revealing what the Lord is speaking to him, to the church in Thyatira. And he says this, the Lord says, write this letter to the angel of the church of Thyatira. This is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze, I know all the things you do. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. And I can see your constant improvement in all these things. But I have this complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from, him, from her immorality. Therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the Lord who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person. And I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. But I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching. Deeper truths, as they call them. Depths of Satan, actually. I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly. Everyone say, hold tightly. Hold tightly to what you have until I come. To all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I receive from my Father, and I will also give them the morning star. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. I just want to take a moment to pray today. Father, I'm going to ask, just as we dive into this word, Lord, I'm going to confess I need your grace. Because I know, Lord, that as, as we try to deliver your word, as we try to share your word, Lord, I, I know I can't do this in my own strength and power, Lord. And so I ask, Lord, may your grace be here. May your spirit be here. Help us, Lord God, to, to understand the foundation you're trying to lie, uh, lay for us as we pursue our, our calling, as we pursue following you, Lord. Help us to discern the foundation you're trying to lay for us. Give us the grace to be more aware of your presence, your activity, and what you want to accomplish within us and through us, Lord. We're going to give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. How do you? 
How does the Holy Spirit empower us to deal with things outside our comfort zone, with difficult things, with hard things? You ever had a hard conversation? You're like, I got to have this conversation with somebody, and you know it's going to be difficult. It's just going to be hard. You know, because sometimes you're, we, right now we're living in a world that it seems no matter what you say, you know, you're, it, it's not hard to push somebody's button these days in the context we live. It's not hard to just set somebody off these days. And so it's like, Lord, we, in order to uphold truth or in order to help uphold your word or, 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 or to live for you, we need your grace. We need your mercy. We need your, um, the power of your Holy Spirit to do this. And so when we start looking at this, you're looking at this church in Thyatira. This is the fourth church John, or the Lord is addressing through John. And, and God in this passage, he, 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 he cuts right, through, the, right uh, through all the stuff that may be confusing in the sense that he identifies himself. This is the Son of God. I want you to know who's speaking to you. This is not coming from anybody. This is the Son of God. Be aware of who's speaking to you right now. Whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. And as the Son of God, he tells them, I know. I know all the things you do. There, there's nothing hidden about you that I don't know about. We have this kind of relationship. He is, I am the Son of God. I know all the things. And he, and he, and he starts with positive attributes, anything, things that every church should embrace. He says, I, I know your love. You are a loving church. Unlike the church in Ephesus, which we talked about a few weeks ago, um, he spoke to the church in Ephesus that they were doing some great things except, except Except one complaint, he says, you, you don't love me like you did before. You don't love me like you did before. He doesn't say that about Thyatira. He says, I see your love. I recognize that. You are a loving church. He also says, I see your faith. You have great faith. You believe in me. You, mean, you believe that with God, all things are possible. You have great faith. I see that. You give him. And I, I see your service. I see the way you look and you, you serve people. You serve each other. You serve people. You know, to, to hear that, that, that's a wonderful thing. You know, being able to um, serve outside of the church while you're talking about, you know, Jesus talks about being faithful with things like um, that one passage in Matthew 25. He's sharing how, you know, um, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When as a stranger, you welcomed me in. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you cared for me. And when I was in prison, you visited me. I mean, these, these are types of, of service. You know, taking care of widows, taking care of orphans. Um, you know, he says, I, I see your love, I see your faith, I see your service. I see these things going on. From, from all outward appearances, it looks like a very healthy, vibrant church. He says, I, I see your patient endurance. I see that you don't quit. You know, you're, you're hanging in there when times get tough. I see that. And then he adds to add to all of that. He says this. He says, I also see your constant improvement in all things. Like you're not just settling for where you're at. You want to keep going. You want to keep improving. You, you're not just settling. You're not just a settling church. But then he, after painting out these, all these positive uh, attributes, from, which from the outside looks really good, he points to something that, that's happening on the inside. He says, what if this one complaint against you? You're permitting that woman... That, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to, feed, uh, to eat food offered to idols. And, and, and when you're looking about this that's happening in this city, so let me talk about Jezebel. Let me, let me just stop right here. So what might have been different in this church in Thyatira, where they lived, is that it was home to, a, there was a great contingent of, of, of Jewish people that lived there, Jewish Christians. Um, and, and what's interesting is that he mentions Jezebel as a woman uh, from the Old Testament, found in Numbers 22, or, or found in the Old Testament. And in, in, that, in the Old Testament, Jezebel was the, was the wife of King Ahab. Uh, King Ahab, Jezebel, they were the arch nemesis of Elijah the prophet. Um, they they were, they, were the, they were the evil monarchy of, of the people of Israel at the time. And they called, they, they led the people of Israel into the, ba uh, the worship of Baal, the worship of Ashtoreth. These are fertility gods. They are false gods. And, and their leadership led the people of Israel out of God's favor and into worship of false gods rather than the worship of the one true God. So they're teaching, you know, this is what, Jeze this is what Jezebel teaching was. 
They led them. She, she calls herself a prophet to lead my servants astray. People who were serving God. People who, were, who, who God commended them for being as servants. He's turning them away, my, my, my servants, and, and teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. So not only did he lead them into fertility God worship, but also into food offered to idols. Now the thing about Thyatira is, is this city was known as a great textile uh, city. Uh, they, they, they're famous for their, I guess in today's vernacular, it would be their unions, their, the guilds. There were a lot of guilds, and so they were big into trading um, purple dye. Uh, purple clothing. In fact, um, if you look into some of the connections, uh, when Paul first went to Europe, he arrived in Macedonia in Greece in the city of Philippi, and his very first convert was a woman named Lydia who was from Thyatira. She was a dealer in purple cloth. Now understand the color purple. I mean, we're talking about, when you think of the color purple in back time, that was a very expensive textile. Um, it would have been the color of royalty, of nobility. So if she's selling that kind of stuff, she's talking with people who got money. You know, this, 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 was, this, is, this, was, this is where it's at. And so to live in Thyatira as a citizen, you know, if, if, if my business was in the, in the textile, as in like purple cloth or, or dealing in purple cloth, in order for my economic business to supply, I would need to be part of the guild. I would need to be connected with other guild members. I need to be part of the union or what you want to, want to call it. But understand that as part of the guild, they also, when they get together for their meetings, they'd also have a ceremonial meal dedicated to their patron god. And so to be part of that means that I would also need to participate in their worship of where they saw uh, how their business would thrive. If they worshiped this false god, they connected it with the, the, thriving, the thriving of their business. And God's saying, this is what this, this is what this teaching, this Jezebel teaching is happening in the church. They are leading my servants into sexual tent and to eat food offered to idols. But then you see God's graciousness in the middle of all this. I mean, this is serious sin. This is Old Testament stuff. And, he's, and because of the Jewish people, he, he refers to Jezebel because in one sense, he's telling them as Jewish Christians, you should know better. You should know better. He's being frank with them. You should know better. But then you see God's graciousness in the midst of this. He says, I gave her time to repent. And that's a wonderful thing. No matter how far we've gone, there's a way back. Right now, there's a window of opportunity to come back to God. We're living in an era of grace right now until he returns. But we see the graciousness of God. God's, God may be, may be filing a complaint, but at the same time, he's, he's making them aware so that they can turn back to him. He's not, he's not being judgy to be judgy. He's, he's making them aware to give them a way back. I, I want the whole purpose, the motivation is restoration. I'm not doing this to beat you down. I'm doing this to make a way of restoration. Amen. I'm doing this as a way to make things right. I'm doing this as a way to turn you from a path that is leading to death to make a choice to turn to a path that is leading to life. He says, I'm calling you out of this because I've called you to this. You know what I'm saying? It's not just what God has called us to, it's recognizing what God calls us out of. Does that make sense? It's, it's, it's a two-part thing. God is calling me. God may be calling me to this, but I gotta, I gotta recognize what God has called me out of as well. Right. I mean, the vision can be clear, but if I don't get the calling of what is God has called me out of, I'll never get to what God has called me to because I'm too comfortable in my comfort zone. Sometimes we don't want to recognize the call out of it because this is our comfort zone. God, I'll go, hard off, I'll go hard after you as long as I can remain in my comfort zone. No, I'm calling you out. I'm calling you out of it. That's an old life. Yeah. That'll hinder you from these, you want these constant improvements in your love and your faith in your service. You want to improve, but this will keep you from being improved. This will keep you from improving in those areas. He says this, he says, I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. Therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds. He's, he, he's, he's wanting the church to recognize by identifying, by unifying with Jezebel, you're hurting yourself. The church is hurts. I, I mean, I, I see a God who's fighting for his church. 
a God who loves his church and is fighting for his church and is trying to have a very difficult conversation, but he's being frank with them. I know all of you, but at the same time, you know that I love you. And he says, he, he, he goes on, he says, he says, I will strike her children dead. Those who follow her teaching, I will strike them dead. He says, why will he do this? He gives us the answer in verse 20. He says, he says I'm doing this so that all the churches will know. So that all the churches will know that who searches out the thoughts and the intentions of every person. And I, will, and I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. But I also have a message for the rest of you and Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching, deeper truths as they call them, depths of Satan actually. I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. Love, faith, service, improvements, your patient endurance. Hold on to all these things. The improvement. In order to improve, you've got to recognize what I've called you out of, not just what I've called you to. What am I calling you out of? You know, for some of us in a very practical way, you know, when God calls us, he, maybe, maybe my past was filled with great anger and hate. Well, if I'm ever going to embrace what God's calling me to, I need, I need to recognize God's calling me out of this hate. God is calling me out of anger. God is calling me out of fear. God is calling me out of depression. Not that we don't, we, we, we're human, so we, we experience these things. I'm not saying that we don't experience these things, but at the same time to recognize that in the middle of my flaws, God is offering me grace. Yes. And I've got to get that grace when I get angry. I've got to grab that grace when I get depressed. I've got to grab that grace when, when I'm fearful. I have to grab those things because God does not want me to live in hate. He doesn't want me to live in anger. He doesn't want me to live in fear. He's called me out of that. He's called me out of that so that I can embrace everything he has for me. The call to what he has for us in the future. I mean, it's important, but just as important as what God has called us out of. He's calling us out of things that are going to hurt our walk with him. What is God trying to do? To, I believe God wants to lay a foundation for us. God wants, I mean, we, we know that, that we need a foundation for every step of our life's calling. We've been, we've been preaching that. We need a foundation for every step of life's calling. The problem is I think, is I, as I think, is I think sometimes we want, we, we, we want to jump to that step. I mean, we, we, have you ever been like, like on a river just jumping from stones? Trying to jump on the river. You've gone camping. You're trying to jump across the river. You ever missed a stone? Falling in the water? I have. We cannot skip this foundational step. The foundation that God laying for us to come out of where he's called us. We need that. God wants to lay a foundation to come out of hate, to come out of fear, or anger, whatever that, that thing is. To come out so that we can also have a foundation for what he's calling us to. He's calling this church. He's laying a foundation for them. He says, hold tightly. Hold tightly. And to all who are victorious, to all in whom my word my word, to all in whom the word of the Lord comes, to all who would open their hearts and allow, give hospitality to the word in their hearts, to all in whom the word dwells and sanctifies, to all, this is, this, this is what victory looks like, when the word can truly enter into our hearts and, and take resonance in our hearts and thereby transform our lives. The word and the spirit is what sanctifies God's people. He's not calling us out, but he wants to sanctify us with his word. He wants to speak life, not death. He doesn't want the teaching of Jezebel to sanctify our lives. He wants his word to sanctify our lives and to fill us. To, this is the victory. I'm gonna, whose word are you going to hold on to? The Jezebel teaching or God's word in your heart? Yeah. To all who are victorious. This is the picture of, victory, of, being, of walking victoriously. I'm going to hold on to the word of God. To all who are victorious and who obey me to the very end. To the very end. To the very end. Who obey me to the very end. To them I will give authority over all the nations. It's not our, our authority, it's his authority. Because I'm not walking towards my own word, I'm walking to, according to his word. I'm carrying his authority. To him I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I receive from my father and I will also give them the morning star. That is a wonderful gift. To wake up every single morning as if it's a brand new day. You know, that, 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 that place where I messed up yesterday, that's, that's yesterday. I got a brand new start. Because of the Lord's great love, I am not consumed. His mercies are never failing. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. 
Great is his faithfulness. What would it be like if we could, if, if we could just learn, if we could discover what if we could discover what it means to live each day as if everything in our past has been in preparation for this moment. Every day. Wake up as if yesterday was in preparation for today. That's redemptive living. That's living a redemptive life. Living, waking up each morning believing that what happened yesterday was in preparation for today to make me better, to live a life of constant improving, of constant going towards God, of seeking hard after God. Now, I want you to understand the problem with Thyatira. Let me just give you a couple more things. The, the problem with Thyatira is that their biggest problem is that they tolerated sin. Let's call it like it is. They tolerated it. They tolerated it. And I want you to understand something about sin, about things that God says are not good for us. What God identifies is that is that we have to remember that the tolerance of sin never ends well. It never ends well. I think that's the biggest deception, one of the biggest deceptions that, that Satan tries to do, that the devil tries to, to, to con people with, is that this is just a little thing. It won't, ha- it won't be a big deal. A little lie, a little stealing, a little deception, the biggest con artist, the biggest con is listening to that kind of stuff. And the thing is that the tolerance of sin never ends well. It never, disobeying what God calls us out of, disobeying what God is calling us to, never ends well. You know, when sin happens, it's, it's literally self-sabotage. Because sometimes we're thinking, you know what, God, if I, if I listen to you, I'm going to miss out on this. Well, if you do this, you're going to miss out on, on God. <laughs> And the thing is, is that when we sin, and you're really understanding that, that not only when we sin do we miss out on what God has for us, not only do we lose something, here, I think about this, we also become less of someone in our character. Not only do we lose something, maybe a little bit of God's favor, a little bit of what God had in store for us, but we also become less of someone in our character. That's what sin does. It destroys. It's self-sabotage. I love this verse in, Je- in, in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17. This is why you need to bring your word because uh, have your word ready with you when you come to church because sometimes the Lord gives me stuff right in the middle of a sermon and, I, and sometimes it may not even be up on the keynote but, but I was led to this actually this morning and I want to share this with you because I think it really highlights this. Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 5 to 10 says this. It says this is what the Lord says. Um, cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited salty land. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green, and they never stop producing fruit. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I, will give, I give all people their due rewards, according to what their actions deserve. Now, when I'm looking at these verses, really, Jeremiah gives us a picture of two ways of being human in the world. There are really two ways of being human in the world. And and, and we might call these two ways the false self and the true self. But there's really two ways of being human in the world. When, when, I, am, when, when I am choosing to, 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 be, to be in my false self, when I describe the false self, I mean living a life of trusting in my own wisdom, my strength, and ability. That's not how God called me to live. It's just how he's choosing to live. That's my false self. It's not really who God created me to be. But I'm going to choose to live that way anyway. I'm, living, I'm trusting in my own wisdom, strength, and abilities. But the truth self is living in a radical trust of God. This is who I was made to be. That that is who I'm called to be. This is is who who we are called to be as a church. 
is living in radical trust to God. Now check this out. When I'm living according to the false self, when I'm, when I'm, I have to come up, I have to manufacture my own identity. I have to manufacture my own purpose. Um, I, I'm literally uh, stepping away from the source of all life and its fullness. Um, I'm, 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 I mean, it, it's completely different. I, in, in fact, because I'm ste stepping away from the source of all life, I also have to manufacture, I, I, and I'm stepping away from the one that can give me all joy, and because I'm stepping away from the one who is, can, can give me all joy, I have to find joy and pleasure in worldly things now. Does that make sense? I have to come up with all these things on my own because I'm, right, I'm relying on, I'm trusting in my own strength, abilities, and, and so I will always have an, ide an identity crisis when I'm living ac according to the false self. But when I'm living according to the true self, who God has called me to be, my identity comes from him. My purpose comes from him. My joy comes from him. It is, it, is, it is such a wonderful place to be. This is where the blessing is at. This is where the source of all life is at. When I'm living according, according to the false self, I, am, I may not want to recognize it, and it's probably one of the biggest cons that the devil would say, but when we're living, in towards, when we're living out a false self life, I'm going to use the word, it, 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 it's a destructive life. It's destructive to myself. It's destructive to others. And it's destructive to the world around me. And let me tell you why. Because when I'm living according to the false self, the false self will always promote me and my agenda above everybody else's. Yeah. It's about me and my agenda at the expense of everybody else. When it comes down to it, it's, it's, it's Darwinian. It's, it's, it's survival of the fittest. And I'm going to win. That's what, this, that's what the world comes What if everybody lived that way? What if everybody lived with that? It's crazy, but that's what happens. That's what happens. When I'm living according to, to my true self, guess, guess, guess whose ide my identity comes from him? It's not about me, it's about him. It's not about my agenda, it's about his agenda. It's, and, and it's about spreading his love to others. We have been created by God and for God. We have been called to be in a relationship. And you and I, we have both been chosen to be vessels of his grace and his blessing to the world around us. Every day we have to wake up. God, how do you want your life to be displayed in me and your power to work through me? This is the true self. This is who God has called us to be. We, we have to recognize that God wants to lay a foundation for us to be able to walk out, to walk out of what we've been called out of and a foundation for what he's calling us to. I love Jesus' example of how do we deal with this. How, 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 how do we deal with the hard things in life? I think it all starts here. Like, I can't deal with the sin on the outside if I'm not willing to let God deal with the sin in my own life. Yeah. Does that make sense? It's like, I need to get comfortable with the Holy Spirit being able to, to deal with stuff in my life and to correct me and be okay. Hey, that, that, you probably should have done that differently. Okay, I need to go. I need to develop the gift of, of saying I'm sorry. It's really a gift. If you can learn how to say you're sorry in most things, you're going to navigate well through life because we can't avoid, we can't live a perfect life. We're going to have to say we're sorry along the way. But let me share this last piece of scripture with you and then I'm going to get ready to close in just a minute here. But in Matthew chapter 4, I was asking the Lord when I'm thinking about the foundation he wants to lay for me um, when I'm dealing with maybe things I need to correct in my life. I, I was looking at when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. Now, if you, if you know anything about, about God's concerned, he's so concerned about sin in our lives that he made provisions in the Old Testament in order for the sin to be removed from his people. God made provisions for the people in the Old Testament in order for the sin to be removed from his people. It would happen every year on the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, this was, this was the day when the high priest would go and offer the sacrifice so that, the sin, so that God's people would be forgiven. In fact, the Day of Atonement would have been celebrated just last month in September for Jewish people. And the idea was, was, it, was the, it was the beginning of a new year. In fact, before the Day of Atonement, during, during this, the first 10 days of uh, Rosh Hashanah, people, the Jewish people would go around, they'd be going to people, if I've done anything to offend you, will you forgive me? If, if, if I have done anything wrong to you, can I, can I repay you? Because before the Day of Atonement, they wanted to make sure that they had, done, they had made their amends with people. 
so that when the Day of Atonement came, they would be forgiven, and then God would bless the, the, the entire next year. And so it was a real high and holy day. And so it was provision to move to sin. And so the, on the Day of Atonement, or when the high priest they would come up, part of, the, part of, part of removing the sin was, was, the, with the, was the law of the scapegoat, is where they would lay the sins. they bring two goats. One would be, one would be, they would lay their hands and put the sin upon the goat, transfer the, their sin onto the goats. One would be sacrificed. And the other goat would be taken out into the desert, into the wilderness by a fit man. And that was to symbolize the removing of sin from the people. You know, so I'm thinking about how, how, how do we remove sin? You know, how, does, how did Jesus do this? Well, when you look at Jesus going in the wilderness, most scholars believe that this was happening in fulfillment of the, scape, of the law of the, scape, of the scapegoat. Jesus came, came, when he arrived on the scene, John the Baptist, his, his, his uh, cousin, said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John chapter 1, verse 29. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the people. And then when Jesus shows up as John is baptizing water, you know, John is saying, man, I, I don't, I'm not even worthy. I'm not even worthy to baptize you. You should be baptizing me. And, and Jesus wants to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. It was really getting ready to fulfill part, aspects of the Old Testament law. And so when he came up out of the water after he was baptized, it said that in Matthew chapter 4 that he was led into the desert by the Spirit of God. This was a picture of Jesus removing the sin, fulfilling the law that removes sin from the people. Now, check this out. We are called to be followers of Christ. When he went out in the desert and he was there for 40 days and 40 nights, he had to deal with temptations, with the sin. And the, guess who showed up while he's out in the, in the wilderness? The devil! He shows up and he says, if you're really the son of God, if this is really your identity, if this is really your true self, then turn these stones into bread. And Jesus responds, man should not live by bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so he wasn't, he wasn't depending on his own wisdom. He was depending on the word of God. He was depending. He was depending on the word of God. And then the devil says, takes him up onto a high place and he says, throw yourself off. The highest point of the temple, throw yourself off. And, and he says, he tries, to, he tries to, to, to present the word in a way that's not true, not in the right context. And he says, his angels will protect you. But Jesus wasn't a stunt man. It wasn't about, it wasn't about him, you know, people, people really looking at him. Jesus was, was trying to live a humble life and do what he was supposed to do. And he says, you're not going to test the Lord your God. It's not about me. I'm not here to be a stuntman, to draw all the attention from people. And then the last thing, he says, I will give you all these kingdoms if you will just worship me. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. So when it talks about how does the Holy Spirit empower us, empower us, empower us to deal with things outside of our comfort zone or to deal with a greater amount of hard conversations, maybe even sin. I'm going to give you three things to think about, three things I think will really help us to lay that foundation. And it's from this story from the wilderness. If you go to the next slide that I have here, one of the things that we have to remember, it's always going to be better. Think about the wilderness. It's always going to be better. I lay a foundation when I'm always depending upon God more than myself. I don't need to turn the stones into bread. I need to rely on the word of God. If I had the power to turn it, which he did, but he didn't. It's always better to depend upon God than to depend upon my own wisdom, strength, and ability. It's, it's always better to step in a place where I'm being my true self with God rather than temptation to show what I'm made of. It's always better to depend upon God. It's always better to lift God up than to lift myself up. It's always better to lift God. If, if I want to be in a place where I can answer the call of God out of where I'm supposed, to, out, of, out of sin or out of places where I shouldn't be, I need to depend upon God. I need to lift God up. And I also need to love God rather than be God. It's always better to love God rather than be God. When those three things are working, Man, it's so much easier 
to walk on this foundation out of what God has called me out of so I can get to the next step on that foundation to where God is calling me to. They both go together. They both go together. It's always better to depend upon God than myself. It's always better to lift God up than myself. It's always better to love God than to be God. Which leads me to a simple takeaway for the day. Remember this when you, when you wake up tomorrow morning on Monday. It's much, more, it's much more difficult to embrace what God has called us to when we are not walking on a foundation for what God has called us out from. We need a foundation. God wants to give us a foundation for what he has called us out of. Just as much as he wants to give us a foundation for what he's called us to. God wants us to have a foundation for what he's called us out of, just as much as he wants us to have a foundation for what he's called us to. They both go together. And when you do this, you're going to be that much more equipped. When, you can, when this is happening on the inside, I'm in a ba- greater, greater place to maybe have a conversation with my brother. And maybe, maybe there's things that I need to let him know. Hey, this is not good for you. It's not good for your marriage. It's not good for your family. It's not good for your church. And I'm not coming from a place where I'm God. I'm not coming from a place where I'm trying to lift myself up. I'm not trying to do this in my own strength and ability. I'm trying to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Very humbly, um, as, a, as a fellow sinner who's trying to rely on grace, I'm trying to speak the truth. I'm trying to up the hold the truth in love. Usually, when I know I'm dealing with, I may be dealing with something where it looks like somebody's off, something's not right. The very first thing I would ever say to them is I'm not coming to, to I'm not going to come and accuse anybody, but I'm going to tell you the very first thing I would ever say to anybody is, are you doing okay? I'm checking in. Are, are you doing okay? Because there may be things I don't know. I have, to, I have to walk humbly say, maybe there's things I just don't know about why they are acting out in a certain way. And so maybe, maybe something's going on at work. Maybe something's going on at home. Is there, how, how can I best serve this situation? You know, it's, and so we, just walking in grace, walking in God's grace. I want to be a vessel of God's grace when dealing with sin. I want to be a vessel of God's grace and his goodness when we have to deal, when I have to have a hard conversation. Always, God, fill me with grace. Fill me with grace. Fill me with love. Help me to walk humbly because I know you've called me out. You've given me a foundation to, 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 to come out of that place, but you also give me a foundation to what you've called us to. Father, I want to thank you for today. I thank you for your grace and your mercy today. I pray for those, Lord, that may be in a difficult place today. Maybe they're, they're, they're dealing with things today, Lord. Maybe, maybe today we're, we're realizing, Lord, that, that the thing you're working within us is you're laying a foundation for that which you've called us out to, out of, Lord. Make that that foundation strong. Make that foundation secure, Lord. Lord, I pray for those that are desiring, they're they're, they're tired of being wound up in a place of anger or hate or fear or worry, Lord God, or whatever that may be, Lord. They just know that where they're at, Lord, they need to get out of. But they know at the same time, as you call them out, Lord God, it may be a place of discomfort. Lord, grant the grace right now. Grant, grant them grace, Lord, for their move, for their journey, for their spiritual journey, Lord. Because I believe that what you're calling them to, that the, that the future is going to be greater than the past. That tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday because of who we are walking with and that we are walking with you. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, your word says that you oppose the proud, but you give grace and favor to the humble, Lord. Give us the grace to depend upon you more than ourselves. Give us the grace, Lord God, to be able to walk in humility and lift you up above ourselves. Lord, give us the grace, Lord, to make it all about you, to love you more than to love ourselves. To give it to you, Lord God. Take your place, Lord God, as our majestic king, exercising majestic sovereignty over every area of of our lives today. Lord, I believe today, Lord, that you are pouring out your spirit upon those, Lord, who would put their faith and trust in you, upon those who would answer the call out of what they are, uh, uh, to answer the call out of where they're at right now today. Uh, Answer the call of where they are coming out of today, Lord, and answer the call to where you're calling them to. Bless them today. Pour out your spirit upon them. Give them the grace, Lord. Give them the words. 
I believe there's even those who are listening to this message today. They may be in a place where they know they have to have a hard conversation with somebody. It's a place that is going to be a little bit out of their comfort zone. Lord, would you empower them with the Holy Spirit? Fill them with the, your grace and your mercy today. Season their words, Lord. Create the kind of, 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 of righteous atmosphere, Lord God. A peaceful atmosphere, Lord, where your glory can be revealed in the middle of it, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus. Maybe you're here today. Um, you recognize the foundations that God wants to lay in your life. You say, Pastor, that's me. And that's me. I need the Lord. I need the Lord's grace to lay those foundations. Make those foundations strong in my life. I want to be able to answer the call of God. The call of him. I want to hear his voice and answer the call of him calling me out from where I'm at and calling me to where I'm supposed to be. I need that foundation today. Just lift your heart, your hand to God. Say, Lord, lay that foundation in my life. I don't want to be there anymore, Lord. I want to improve in my love in my faith, in my service, Lord. Give me the grace to patiently endure where things aren't right, where things aren't in an alignment yet, Lord. I need it, Lord God. Lay that firm foundation for me today, Lord. I want to continue to grow and move forward in my relationship with you. Lord, I pray for those whose hearts are being lifted up, whose hands are being lifted up today. Would you bless them, Lord? Would you give them an extra measure of your grace and your mercy today? In the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray today. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Bless your name. As grace is being poured out, know that he's touching your mind. He's touching your heart. He's touching your spirit. He's pouring out. As a, he's anointing you from the top of your heads, the soles of your feet, so that the thoughts, your hearts, can come together in alignment with his word, so that you may be a vessel of his mercy and his grace in the world, Lord God. Deliver them, Lord. Bring them to your place, Lord. Shelter them, Lord, as they travel from Egypt to their promised land, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. Maybe you're here today, maybe you're listening online. Maybe you've never made a decision to come out, to, to never made a decision to follow Christ because God's calling you today. He loves you. And maybe you need to do that today because God wants you to live each day as if your past has been in preparation for this next moment of your life. Maybe you're not sure that if you were to die today that you know you're gonna go to heaven and you wanna be sure. We want to say this prayer right now and commit our lives to Jesus Christ and begin that brand new day, even as it starts today on this, on this Sunday, Lord, to begin the week out right in you. If you need to make a decision for Christ, maybe you need to recommit your life to Christ. We're going to do that together, even right now. Let's say this prayer and make this decision together, Lord. Let's say this together. And de uh, dear Jesus, I'm so sorry because I've blown it many times. And so today I ask you to forgive me. I believe you died for me to pay the price for my sins, to remove my sin far from me, and that you were also raised back up to life to give me a brand new day, a brand new life to be lived for you. Lord, I invite you into my heart. Forgive me my sin and help me to live a life that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. If you said that prayer this morning, please, please, please go to Columbia Life Church. Let me know. Click me, let me know. If, you, if you're following Christ, just click on that link to make a decision for Christ. Let me know that you followed him. Send me a link so I can be praying for you. I want to be able to resource you and make sure you're, you're doing well on your journey. Uh, to follow Christ today. Today's a new day. Today's the beginning of a great week, a new season. And I believe God's going to bless you. I believe there's divine appointments for each and every one of you to touch people's lives.